Hey everyone, welcome to a very cold edition of Quick Hits today. On the day that we're recording at a wonderful high of minus 21 degrees is what we're expecting, which is completely freaking out my California guest today. Uh, Sean Pierce for Quick Hits, bringing back my fitness enthusiast, warm weather enthusiast friend, Katrina Klein. How are you doing? Are you warm down there, Katrina? It, it is very warm. I'll send some your way. <laughs> cannot get here soon enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, many of you will remember we, uh, we had Katrina as a guest in the past, and we talked at that point in time just in terms of some of the uh, quick tips and stuff like that for things that you can do to make sure that you are working effectively and as pain-free as possible in your operatory. And we're going to take that to another level a little bit today. And we're talking about the world of ergonomics in dentistry. Trina, what do people need to know about the world in ergonomics and dentistry other than you want to be warm when you're doing it? <laughs> well, if you get breathable scrubs, then you can be warm in your room. But um, <laughs> oh, what do we need to know? There's so many things. Uh, you know, when it comes to ergonomics, a lot of it has to do with the strategies that we're using during the day, how we practice, how we do the job that we do. And so you know, we kind of talked a little bit about equipment last time and things like that. Um, but, but really, there's so much more to it. It's the way that we're positioning our patients. It's the way that we're positioning ourselves in our chairs. It's the equipment that we're using. It's the operatory setup. Um, everything from lighting in the room to uh, the, the stools that we sit on. So that there's a lot involved there. And of course, body awareness is how you sit in that chair or stand in that, in that room. So let's break into that a little bit. And when we're talking about equipment, um, you know, let's let's get down into nuts and bolts, so to speak, if you will, on that front and, and, and think about what are some of the really important pieces of equipment that you think are, are beneficial to dentists, assistants, hygienists to make sure that, you know, they're properly positioned from an ergonomic perspective so that, you know, we're talking about being able to maintain um, health and well-being for a long and hopefully, uh, hopefully profitable career. So the first thing is when it comes to equipment, um, we talk about ergonomic equipment, and I say that word very carefully because anybody who can attach ergonomic to a product they, they can make a little bit more money because everybody's focused on this right now with all of the at-home workers, even people who are not in dentistry, um, we're all experiencing body pain. And so throwing ergonomic on something makes people think that, oh, it's going to make my body feel better. And that's not always the case. So the first thing we need to do when we look about equipment is ask yourself this question, does this product help me stay in neutral posture? If the answer is yes, then great. If the answer is no, then it may be a good piece of equipment, but it's not ergonomic equipment. So that's the first thing. Um, the next thing is for, for dental professionals, um, number one, loops with a light. We can no longer be using that overhead light where we're constantly adjusting. This is an MSD waiting to happen. <laughs> Your shoulders don't like it. You can't see around it. Your field of view is blocked the whole nine. So loops in the light, first off, if you're not using it, most of us are now, but you got to have a good loop, uh, loop magnification set and light. Um, there's cordless, there's not cordless. It's, you know, all of it comes down to weight on the front of your face, because at the end of the day, in a dental professional's life, our head is basically um, there to facilitate weight on our cervical spine, which is our neck. And so when we put 10 degrees of forward flexion and we look 60 degrees down, that's the equivalent of me putting six 10 pound bowling balls off the front of my face. So how many ounces do you load up on your head and on the front of your face is extra weight. So just those are things to keep in mind. If you're going to wear one of these shields, it's like a, an army battalion thing that you have on your head with a vacuum for zero pressure and oxygen. A lot of these things we were seeing during a, the initial part of COVID, uh, you know, that's all weight on the front of your face. So my first rule is the less weight, the better, um, the less plastic hanging off the front of your face, the better. And um, when it comes to loops and lights, I like the corded because that puts no battery on the front of my face and a bright, bright light. So that's one thing. Another thing is a saddle stool. They really are all they're cracked up to be. They keep us in neutral posture because they keep our, our core engaged 
And they also don't allow the legs to be at 90 degrees, which is kind of an, an old way of thinking that we, we put ourselves at 90 degrees at the elbow, 90 degrees at the hip and 90 degrees at the knee. Thankfully, we learn over time and we now know that that's not good. We don't want to be in that position. So if we can get our legs to be closer to 135 degrees or more so that we're a lot closer to standing than sitting, we experience a lot less low back pain because the muscle that attaches our legs to our spine is attached to all of our lumbar vertebrae, which just pulls it forward. And that's where we end up in pain at the end of the day is our low back, most of us and our neck. So, so there's that. Yeah. So, and that, I guess, is the big thing. Like you're, you're a big advocate, obviously, with respect to the saddle stools. And, and, and I mean, I, I, I can sort of see it, you know, we're, we're looking at it from the standpoint of the typical person, whether it's someone working in a dental office or your admin team working out in, in the front who is sitting uh, for the bulk of their day, particularly if they're sitting, as you say, with the legs at a 90 degree angle, that's going to really tighten up the hip flexors. It is a lot. Yeah, it's no different than when you go um, for a long car ride and you're sitting at that 90 degree. The first thing you do when you get out of that car is you push your hips forward and your low back because that psoas muscle, that hip flexor muscle is tight and shortened. So you stretch it back out and then you feel better. So it's it makes complete sense when you think about that with respect to sitting all day at work. But as much as I'm a saddle stool advocate, I'm even more an advocate for standing in dentistry. That is huge because now we're literally in neutral posture and we can micro shift our body because the enemy in the body is stagnant, chronic compression of joints and limbs. And so if we can have small movements where we're just shifting a little bit, when we go to reach for something, for something, we don't, we can shift our whole body. We can take a tiny step this way or a tiny step that way. We're faster, we're more efficient. The body likes it. The only thing the body doesn't like, if we're, of course, if we're standing literally all day long is our feet don't like standing. So get some good footwear and some compression socks and you're good to go. It's, it's a much happier body <laughs> that's not sitting all day because sitting is literally the new smoking. <laughs> I've been, I was going to say that I've read that so many times. Um, I haven't personally gotten into the compression socks, but I've seen a lot of people, you know, doing that for wearing them for their workouts, particularly if they're distance runners or something like that. So how would the compression socks even help somebody working in the dental field? So what happens is, um, and as a, as a runner, um, I am an advocate for compression socks. When you do distance running, it's because your feet swell. And so when you're all day long on your feet, the the feet do swell. And so if you can use compression to keep the blood flow going back throughout the body, you don't have as much pain in your feet. And then you can also distribute your, you know, your, your blood levels. Like when you sleep at night, things distribute back out, right? When you're standing all day long, everything kind of, you know, gravity (laughs) all goes down. So you'll, you'll feel more relief with your feet, your ankles, your, and your calves, all of this. So if you're going to be on your feet for eight hours a day, it's a thing. I mean, waitresses and waiters have been doing it for decades. So they must be, they must be doing something right. (laughs) And historically, you know, for, for people working in those sort of industries, we've al- always talked about footwear in the form of the shoes and having um, supportive, but, you know, somewhat flexible, strong where it needs to be flexible, where it needs to be tight footwear. Um, but the compression socks aspect, I don't know if that was something around. I, I That seems to be a little bit of a newer one. So kind yeah. of interesting you, you touched upon that. And and obviously the saddle stools are are a big thing and not just because everyone's a fan of Yellowstone these days and want to get on a saddle stool thinking that, you know, that you're not taking your patient to the train yards. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, what we don't realize is that when we use a saddle stool and we're not using a lumbar rest, we're actively engaging our core in order to sit upright. So if you know, if I, and I'm currently sitting in a saddle stool now. And so when you look at me from the side, you can see that my ears over the shoulders, which is then follows all the way down. It, it's because my core, my, my stomach muscles, which are responsible for spinal position and spinal um, support, they're doing their job. And, and I would argue that lumbar seating, lumbar assisted seating, 
when we're supposed to be actively engaging our core is what leaves so many of us with a weak core in dentistry. So, I mean, if we're going to use that lumbar rest, use it for when you're sitting back talking about treatment in a casual conversation with a patient without gloved hands. And that way you're knowing that, okay, my core is engaged. I know I'm going to be sitting more upright because of that. So it's, there's so many benefits to the, the saddle stool that what I usually will recommend is that for longer procedure, use your saddle stools for doctors, um, for hygienists, every other patient stand, stand. And when you are sitting, sit in a saddle. And that, that's a nice balance. Your feet won't be quite so sore at the end of the day. Um, I also recommend that for your doctors, hygienists, here's a little tip that, that the doctors love. Make sure that the patient is up so that the doctor can walk in and stand doing hygiene checks. It's faster for them. It's more efficient for them. And then they won't resent you quite as much <laughs> for having to break away and come into your room. <laughs> well, you're giving me all kinds of things I want to follow up on. I want to go back first before okay. I touch on, on the patient positioning aspect, because you talked about with, with the loops that you prefer the corded loops versus, um, I guess, you know, having the extra weight of the battery pack on the front. So in general, when we're talking about corded versus um, uncorded uh, equipment is is there a difference when it comes to your ergonomic benefits there definitely is because even though we're dealing with ounces um, it's still ounces on a trajectory so you, you know what may be a three ounce battery really equates to about you know a pound or two of weight on your cervical spine because we have to remember that there are only you know they're very tiny tiny muscles in your neck or, or vertebrae in your neck tinier muscles. And so there's a lot going on there and we get that forward head posture going on and it really can be, it can be a nightmare. I mean, the, the x-rays that I see from people that come in with their straight necks because they've had their face down in a patient and lunged forward. I mean, we all have neck pain. So the less weight we can have on the front of our face, the better. I mean, I look at, um, here's a particular shield. It's, it's like 90% plastic. It's just, it's, it's just a thin sheer something. So the less you can put on the front of your face, the better. And I like the cord because if I can string it between my, my scrub top and my lab coat, this, the cord never gets in the way. It just goes down the back and then wraps around. And that's always been an issue for people is, oh, my cord gets stuck somewhere or um, I, it bugs me because it moves around. Just kind of put it in between layers and then it doesn't do that. And then you eliminate the front of the face weight. Right, right. And, and that's the thing. Like I could certainly see some people feeling that, but the cord's a nuisance. It, it, wouldn't I be better off with less restriction from not having a cord? And then I can move more freely. But you have to counter that with, as you said, um, depending upon how you're using a particular piece of equipment that now we're talking about something that's going to add weight, whether it's to our head or our neck, what have you, you know, yeah. our shoulders, um, it's all, they're all connected. Right. Yeah. That, that song we learned in kindergarten about the knee bones connected to the hip bone, you know, that it's true. I mean, what we do in one part of the body affects everything and it's a domino effect from the front of our face all the way down and vice versa. So, you know, when we talk about, we were talking about footwear and things like that and how we're standing and sitting, when we're sitting in a saddle stool, we're much more likely to keep our, both of our feet flat on the ground, as opposed to when you sit in a traditional chair, we all want to hike that one foot up and put it on the wheel. The problem with that is that that foot's connected to the knee, which is connected to the hip. And if you have one hip higher than the other, what's happening to your spine? It's moving. And then you're compensating with your shoulder. So we want our feet flat on the ground at all times in dentistry. And so using a, a chair that that leans towards that, that makes you want to do that, because it's a lot more difficult to put your foot up on a saddle stool because you're sitting up higher than on a, on a traditional lumbar chair. And the whole reason we're doing that in those lumbar chairs is because we're uncomfortable. We're perched on the edge. We're sitting, you know, we're trying to do everything we can to get comfortable in this really not neutral chair that doesn't sit us 
set us up properly. It's just unnatural. And that's why we're trying to hike up a foot, sit this way, sit that, everything we can do to get comfortable bio, biomechanically, and it just doesn't work. Well, and, and I sort of compare that to the principle that I would see working in, in law offices some 20 odd even 30 years ago, when, you know, you would maybe you would go into someone's office that was having some back issues, uh, they wouldn't sit on their traditional lumbar chair anymore, they were prescribed to sit on, essentially, what we would see in a gym is one of those exercise balls. Uh huh. And not for the whole day, because that might be too much. But the idea behind it, as you say, and it's going to be probably similar in principle to the saddle stool, is it's forcing them into a posture that engages the whole core in a proper ergonomic positioning it's allowing the muscles that are supposed to be working in a particular way to work in that particular way right. to support the spine right and that took pressure off of their backs right and there are even um those yoga ball chairs for operatories in dentistry i mean i've seen several of them the downside to those is that the pressure changes and so you constantly have to pump them up yes. Yes. <laughs> and and they're large and, yeah. um, you know, our operatories are not necessarily very big. So, you know, we're talking real estate. So really something on wheels is a lot, is a lot better for you. Well, I'm, I'm not advocating the yoga balls in, a, in an operatory. That's why I specifically pointed out that like, this isn't an office. I'm, I'm behind it. Right. I'm not having to move around as much. You know, I'm not seeing, seeing a patient. I'm sitting there and I'm working on papers and files right. or, or what have you. It's a different nature of the work. It worked for them. It's just that the principle is similar to what the saddle chair would do for you in the operatory. Right. But I'll tell you what, I'd rather see somebody in a yoga ball chair because they have these chairs now for the operatories where it's like a yoga ball on casters. Yep. So you can roll. And I'd rather see somebody on one of those than a traditional stool. Yeah. For the for same sure. concept. For sure. It's, it, I mean, it's those sort of things are definitely worth the investment. I know sometimes people will look and think, oh, but this, this stool is so much cheaper, but how much is, is, is time off and not being able to treat patients because your back is out going to cost you. You get what you pay for. Exactly. If they're exactly. giving you a free chair. <laughs> It's a free chair for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> now, another thing you touched on that I wanted to get into a little bit was when you were mentioning having the hygienist make sure that the patient is up uh, as high as, as the dental chair can, can allow so that the dentist can, can walk in to do any sort of uh, exam relatively quickly, not have to spend time doing adjustments. It's fast, it's efficient. So we're getting into the importance of patient positioning as well from the standpoint of ergonomics. So talk to me a little bit about that. How important do you see that aspect as well? Yay, she says. That's like my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so, so patient positioning is everything. 70% of our patients walk in the doors and they say, I can't lay back. Even though we all know that they sleep in bed every night vertically or horizontally. I mean, come on. So a lot of this though is patient training and comfortability and trust because ultimately we need to train our patients and, and gain their trust, it's a very vulnerable position that we're asking them to go in. I mean, if you think about it, supine, if you look at a dog, the way that they submit is to completely lay on their back. And humans are not too far removed from that idea in wrestling or in other sports and things like that. If you have someone on their back, you're, they're at your mercy. And so dentistry is not too far removed from that, plus sharp instruments. I mean, come on guys. So we have to gain our patient's trust and um, that way they will allow us to move them into those, those positions that we need them in. Now, when it comes to that, moving them all the way back is huge. But what a lot of the times we do is we're told initially to move them back a little bit and then see if they're okay to move back a little bit more and then a little bit more because we wanna you know, make sure that they're comfortable. What we really want to do is we want to tell them, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, I'm going to move you on autopilot all the way back, and then we'll move you up to where you're comfortable from there. The difference is that most people, it's about control. It's about having the ability to say, that's too, or that's a, that's too much there. I'm not comfortable there. Let me come up a little bit more. So you bring them up an inch. How about that, Mrs. Jones? Is that okay? How about just a little bit more? And you bring them up a little bit. 
90% of the time, it's going to take maybe two or three adjustments and they're going to be fine with that because they've made the choice. You may come all the way back up, but not likely. As opposed to if you start at the beginning, you're only going to get two or three adjustments to go back. So you've gained a lot more distance when you've done it the other way and you've still allowed the patient to have control over their positioning. So that just something easy like that can make all the difference in the world. And then there's another thing, most of us have adjustable headrest. So if your patient is sitting kind of upright because they have vertigo or they have a back or a neck injury and they literally cannot lean back all the way or lay back and they sleep in a lazy boy or they're whatever, moving their headrest. So if this is the back and this is the head, just move the headrest back. So essentially, if I'm the patient, and I'm leaning back like this, but my headrest is straight. How are you going to get in there? But if you can move the headrest, suddenly you can see further back in there, but their body is up more. So number one, put the headrest back. Number two, use autopilot and let autopilot be the bad guy and bring them up from the bottom. <laughs> Those are just a couple things that we can do to make our job easier allow us to get in there and see and allow the patient to be trained on where they need to go. And then the last thing I would say is indirect vision. That we need to live, eat, and breathe indirect vision. That is so big for what we do, uh, as, especially as hygienists. Um, I mean, doctors are, are very well prepped for it because you spend one time in one area for the whole time. And you, if you're not using indirect vision on number two or number 15, you're done for. So Doctors really get this one, but hygienists are the worst. <laughs> and we start doing this, <laughs> trying to look in the mouth. So live, eat, and breathe in direct vision for sure. And that'll help you even for those patients that can't lean back all the way. Do you have any tips that you, tell, you share with hygienists who may be struggling with uh, using their indirect vision skills? So when it comes to indirect vision, there are some exercises that we can do at home. We'll use a shoe box in front of us and use the indirect vision. Um, and then the other hand to, um, you know, draw on papers. They're, they're exercises we're given in school when we first learn how to do indirect vision. But ultimately, you just have to do it. Because what it comes down to is speed. You just have to decide, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take my time. I'm going to be a little slower on this today. But because I practiced, I'm going to get better. Yeah. Now, one last thing that I want to get into, and again, you touched on a little bit earlier when you kept talking about real estate, and that's the idea of how we set up our operatories. And I mean, I'm going back and thinking dentistry in days gone by when it was how many ops can you cram into 1,500 <laughs> square feet of total office space? You know, <laughs> the more ops, the more I, I'm producing, the happier I am. Uh, all nice great if you if you can do it but sometimes that really puts a restriction in terms of where we can set up our our equipment to be as ergonomically and friend, friendly as possible how much we can move around to be able to work how we how much we can work move around with our assistants and have our assistants similarly move with us as a team so that we're effectively working together and, and being as ergonomically friendly as possible. So how are we balancing out those sort of spatial issues these days from an ergonomic perspective? Um, a lot of that would depend on when the practice was built, if it was built in the, in the cram it together days or if it's a newer practice. Today's operatories are a lot bigger. Um, but with those older ones, the first thing I do when I go in and do an assessment is I move the patient chair towards the, the foot wall or window, whatever they have there. Um, there are usually a few inches, if not several inches of space between where they place the patient chair in the room versus where it can be. And we need 24 inches of space behind where the patient's head lays and whatever's behind us. To work at 12 o'clock, which is directly behind the patient, we need enough space to roll from the side to the behind them, essentially, so that we can do our most effective work. So that's where we are most ergonomically sound and biomechanically less likely to trunk twist or head turn or lean over. So at 12 o'clock at that head positioning, that's probably the most important place to have 
that space, even in a room that's very tiny. So if there are carts behind, keyboard, platforms, um, cabinetry, I've seen people take out cabinetry behind them just so you can get into that space because that which we can do easily, we do. If it takes effort, like rolling across carpet in a chair, we don't do it and instead we lean and our body suffers for it. So move the patient chair toward the window or the wall. That'll give you a few extra inches and that might just be what it takes to get you where you need to be. That would be my first thing. <laughs> you read Atomic Habits, didn't you? Huh? You read the book Atomic Habits, I think, didn't you? I have not. Is oh, it good? well, you should because that's one of the Atomic Habits you just touched upon. Those things that you wish to do and reinforce, make them easy because oh. of human tendency is that, you know, the more difficult, the more obstacles we place in our way, the less likely we are to make something a habit. Right. Yes, I completely agree. Now I need to read the book. <laughs> it's a very good book. I'm going to recommend it, not right. only to you, but to anyone else who's watching. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. But that's really the name of the game when it comes to operatory setup. You know, we want we want things to be easy to reach. We want our instruments and our uh, all of our devices that we get to be 12 inches from us so we don't have to lean forward. Because if we have to lean, we will. We're much less likely to reach if it's with if it's outside of 12 inches from the body. And I say that as a general number. For me, I'm, a, I'm five foot one, I'm a very small person. So I probably need things to be about eight inches from me, but a very tall person has a little more leeway. So 12 is kind of a rough magic number. 24 inches behind the patient is also a rough magic number. If I'm a smaller person, it doesn't have to be quite as big. If I'm a little bigger, I'm gonna need a little more. You know, just make it easy. Get in there so that you can bring your equipment, get the patient in, into a proximal to you. So you, if your patient head is 15 inches from your body, you're having to lean. <laughs> so get in there. Those, the, the get close to your patient thing, we all learn in school, but sometimes some of us struggle with it. And, and you know, you, you touched upon a little thing there as well that I think is really important to keep in mind in that when we're setting these things up in our operatory to be as ergonomically friendly as possible, you do have to create, you need space, but you also need that sort of adjustable space because right. a tiny person like, like yourself, um, you know, that average length of space, as you said, of 12 or 24 inches or whatever it is, could be harmful to you. Right. Yeah. If I'm too far away, it's going to be a more of a struggle for me and it could cause me bodily injury. You know, it's, it's kind of one of those things where there is no one size fits all exactly. um, to patients to clinicians, to assistants, uh, to equipment. So, you know, that's why it's very important to have someone help you and, and come in and, and look at your room. If you're doing a practice build out, have someone come in, take pictures. I, I mean, I've done consults with doctors who are building uh, new rooms or they're renovating their offices and they want to know where should I set things up? What's, what's a good chair? Um, you know, what's a good this? One of my clients recently went through several, he has a, a chair graveyard because he thought it was his stool that he was sitting on this whole time when he was having pain because of his computer setup. The counter was too high. The, the keyboard was too high. His mouse was too high. Everything he, you, you reach for these things multiple times in an appointment. And if it's, if it's becoming a problem for you, because it's not ergonomically set up, it may have nothing to do with anything that you're doing in the mouth. It's just something you're doing on your keyboard. Exactly. So, you know, we, we remedied that and we found another solution for that, but it took me going out to his office and doing an assessment for him thinking, okay, is it, is it the chair you're sitting on? Is it the way the patient's sitting? Is it the way you're practicing? I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody with better posture, working posture ever. So it wasn't him. It was yeah. his room. Yeah. Lots of great tips and the importance as we talked about in, ter in terms of ergonomics. I mean, we are talking about your career and making sure that you have a long and, as I said, profitable and enjoyable career and that you maintain your health for all the other things that you want to do to enjoy your life as well. Because it's, it's about that. It's about yeah. quality of life, right? Yeah. It, 
it's it's about making sure that that you know we're we're in good shape to spend time with our families and friends and stuff like that so you know if any of us frozen canadians wanted to get a warm breath of fresh air or some ergonomic advice from you katrina what's the best way for them to reach out to you I have an, a website, ergofitlife.com. My email is ergofitlife at gmail.com. I'm on Facebook. I've got a group. I've got a page. I'm on Instagram. Um, it's at ergofitlife underscore Katrina. If you look up ergofitlife, you're going to find me on Google or anywhere. <laughs> um, email me, reach out to me, message me. I get pictures. Um, I get questions all the time on everything from fitness to nutrition to ergonomics to dental equipment to assessments to you know what kind of stretches do I do there's so much to this biomechanical friendliness that leads to ergonomics and everything that I just want to help so reach out to me I'm, I'm not afraid to get back to people I do my very best and um, and I'm always here appreciate your time. The second time that you've been here for us. It's great to have you back. Great to see you. I'm glad that one of us is warm. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate you inviting me back. It's always fun. I always enjoy our talks and, and uh, I'm going to send some warm, some warm weather up to you. <laughs> I'll push some warmth from California. Yeah. Well, I'm send it in a jar. I don't think it's going to get here anytime soon. <laughs> Hopefully you guys will thaw out in time for the summer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, that wraps it up for another edition of Quick Hits. And I look forward to, to being back with another guest in the very near future. Hope you enjoyed this one and take care. Stay warm. Bye, everyone. Bye.